Okay, um, I'm just going to be giving a talk sort of on some of the hobby stuff I do and some of the thoughts I've got about sort of where music recording and that and sort of studio stuff is going. Um, basically, I've called it linking outside the box because, as I'll explain, it's what's kind of happened over the years with um, digital audio workstation stuff is it's all moved into the PC and this is kind of a process of trying to get some of the control of it back out again because a mouse and keyboard are not really the ideal interfaces. So basically we're going to have a quick history lesson of how sort of music used to be done and how it's now being done. Um, and then have a look at some of the ways of getting, connecting things up and the various sort of protocols and things we can use. And I'll look at some of the hardware sort of solutions I've been building and playing with um, and then some of the software ideas I've got. And we'll have a look at some of the future directions of where maybe things are going. So basically, in a traditional sort of analog um, music production, you've really got three broad um, steps. They're obviously not all followed exactly like that, and there is some overlay between them depending on how live it is or um, the mixing and mastering sometimes crosses. But generally, it's um, very much a sort of capture process. In the old days, it was onto multi-track tape. Um, and then it's your sort of mix down where you bring in those various tracks, you um, position them in the stereo field, you kind of sort out any phase corrections when you're doing that. Um, and then the final mastering generally was, it was a very formal step because you were mastering for uh, a vinyl format or cassette formats where you had to do a whole lot of, sort of prefixes um, in the sort of vinyl format. You would force all the bass into the center because records physically couldn't handle a stereo bass signal. Um, on the tape, you'd obviously add Dolby. So it was very much a very clearly defined sort of set of steps. Um, and then over the years, as you've digitized more and more of it, we sort of, well, sorry, there's, there's an example of what I was going to show. So it's your capture process. There is some um, sort of steps that you're going through where you're modifying the signal at capture. Um, but what I sort of really wanted to display here is that at every step of the process, you've got a lot of buttons to control what you're doing. And every button has its own function. When it's set up, you can kind of leave it, and it just, it just works um, the next time you come around. Of course, it um, doesn't translate very well to a week later where somebody might have moved it. You can't save the settings, short of taking a photograph or putting scribble tape all over it and marking it. So it's, it's great. You know, you don't lose the settings um, immediately between sessions, but it doesn't last very long either. So that, that's kind of the process, the mixing process. Again, there's a lot of buttons to control everything. It's a very physical um, sort of human interface um, being designed over a long time to do exactly what it's meant to do. Um, and then again in the, in the final mastering stage. Nowadays what you're seeing in a um, digital workstation is a lot more of this is done all in the box. It, there's a kind of a lot of overlay, a lot more overlay. So generally when you're doing the recording, you will still keep all the tracks separate, but in the same solution that you're doing the recording, you will start doing some of the mixing because you're using all the tools there. Um, what I've done here is that rather than say guitars, I'm sort of proving it that, you know, with a lot of the synthesizers and um, sequencer type stuff, a lot of the music creation is also happening inside the box now. So there is still an analog component, with microphones, guitars and things, but even a lot of that is now sort of moving inside and is becoming done effectively with a mouse and keyboard. Um, and again, so the whole process, you're still doing all the same things, but a lot of the outboard effects now are just plug-in devices, um, VSTs or LV2s and stuff. Um, but basically it's still the same process, but it's all happening inside that. And your only way in traditionally is through a keyboard and a mouse can get pretty clumsy because also your screen space, unless you've got a multi sort of six screen device, you end up with windows on top of each other, which is not really ideal in music because you want to be watching all the levels. You want to move three or four faders at the same time. You can't really do that with a mouse. So it's not an ideal interface. Um, so that, so some of the gains you get when you move to digital, obviously your, most of your path is lossless. You're not getting the sort of delay. And every time you go tape to tape to tape, you, you're adding a little bit of noise in there. Other than the effects you're adding and stuff, you're not really losing anything. Um, 
your recall now between takes and stuff is a lot better. So when you bring your project up, every setting you had is already there exactly as you left it. You don't need to write it down or have it stored anywhere. A lot more portable, of course. You're not moving a studio with you wherever you go. And infinitely editable, whereas in the tape days, that was, you know, when you start splicing tape, it really is a one-off thing. You can't keep doing it. Um, but you've lost that interface. You, you really do give up quite a lot for that. So there's an example of, you know, the typical mixer desk. Everything is designed to kind of fit human hands, and it, it's, you know, it is... It was never designed just to be flashy or to look nice. It's designed to be practical, um, which is the big thing that we've given up. So how are we going to get stuff back into our computer and you know, start using some external devices? Um, on a traditional computer, really, for um, external sort of control devices, USB and network are the most common ways in. Firewire is great for audio. Um, it does support MIDI. But it's a pretty expensive solution if you just want to do MIDI because it's, it's such a low um, signal rate. You don't need the, the whole setup of Firewire. Um, and network. Obviously, most computers have got a network now. It's pretty fast. It's pretty versatile. Um, and the two equivalent technologies that kind of map to those is MIDI. MIDI is traditionally a, a sort of serial port type-based protocol, but most MIDI adapters now are USB adapters. Um, and the MIDI spec does actually have a proper USB device class in it. Uh, and then open sound control, pretty much Ethernet based UDP packets over the network, um, can work over wireless, can do pretty much anything. We're not really trying to do proper music playback, it's more control. So we're not worried about sort of, you know, 10 millisecond kind of latencies, it can be a little bit slower. So MIDI, um, designed really to capture and play back um, musical instrument notes and um, pedals and that kind of thing. Not originally designed purely as a control interface. Um, very, very compact. Everything is sort of bit level. So a, a note off signal is three bytes, you know, and you have to actually measure the first four bits indicate the, um, the command itself. The next four is the channel. So it's very, very low level. Ideally designed, if you're building a little microcontroller type circuit, really good because it's also designed so that you get as much information up front rather than later on. So you can make your kind of coding decisions very early on without having to hold a big buffer of information. Where when you're designing on a microcontroller with sort of 8K of RAM, those things become quite important. Wide industry support, um, virtually all Synthesizers, um, outboard devices, all have some form of MIDI control built into them. Um, traditionally, it's 31, 2500 board. It looks, from a hardware point of view, it looks pretty much like a serial port. Um, and as I said earlier on, there is also a USB standard. Some of the limitations are it's only got 60 channels per um, sort of message set, that or per device. That generally is ignored by most devices. They listen on all of them anyway, because trying to set each device to its own channel, particularly in the software world, is people thought it was just too much of a pain because you start with one device and you're only ever going to use one, so I'll just listen on everything and make it easier. So the 16 channels don't really even exist as, a, as an expansion option. It's generally you've only got one kind of thing on each one. The um, actual size of the data itself is generally a 7-bit so the data information it's sending. So if you're moving like a fader, you're only going to get a 7-bit signal, which is from 0 to 127 as, as a value range, which is fairly grainy. Um, particularly if you're moving it fast, you tend to get that zipper kind of effect. It's, you know, the, the human ear can notice it. Um, each channel allows you to have one 14-bit signal, which is your pitch control. But again, you've only got one per channel, so you end up really trying to hack to get more than one of those in. So if you're building a multi-fader device, you very quickly run out of options, short of making it look like a multi-USB device. Um, open sound control, as I said, it's TCP/IP based. It uses a more sort of um, human-readable URL-type notation. It, the messages are specific to the application, so it allows the application to expose itself in a much clearer way. In, the case of MIDI, it's really you've got note on, note off, um, continuous controller type messages. They're very specific to what a musical instrument would have been creating. 
and when we move to using it to actually control applications, we kind of hack. So some applications will say, well, I'm going to use notes on, notes off to control a button, and I'm going to use continuous controllers for my volume type settings. Other people do things other ways. There's no standard. So at least with open sound control, there's a little bit of um, sanity in the world again, in that the things are human readable. An application can say, these are my sort of standard set of interfaces, and it's not going to clash with anybody else's hopefully. If you're writing at the microcontroller level, of course, this becomes a lot harder because you are doing a lot more work. You, you've pretty much got to store 20 bytes there before you can even make a decision about what you're doing. You've got to have a whole TCP IP stack sitting on your chip. So it's really, for that small microcontroller stuff, is not as great from a programming point of view. Um, port mapping is still an issue because everybody picks as I'm on this port, I'm on this port. From an automated point of view where you want to have a whole bunch of outboard kit automatically connect and know what it's talking to, there's still a lot of mapping and kind of hacking around that you've got to do. So um, some of the things I've been doing is I've been trying to build some hardware devices that use MIDI. As I said, MIDI is fairly simple. It uses a serial protocol and or a USB class interface. Um, that's a basic MIDI idea. I'm jumping in a little bit technical here just to sort of give you a, a quick overview of it. It uses DIN plugs. It's always got an optocoupler on it. The idea is that there's no um, signals, you know, um, hum or any kind of static can get carried through into any other equipment. That's pretty much mandated by the original standard. So everything goes through an optocoupler. And that's really it. And then it's just like a serial port coming out of there. Um, pretty simple, really. This is a, one of the sort of projects I built. I might try and plug it in if we have time. It's basically that's what it looks like. Um, simple circuit board. It, it's pretty big and looks complicated, but it's not really. It just had to fit into there. Um, again, two DIN plugs at the top and the optocoupler, CPU, and a couple of other devices to do it. So really pretty simple. And there it is. That's what it looks like. So this is just a four channel with a master. Um, just analog faders and some rotary controllers. Um, rotary controllers are a bit of a funny, again, because one of the things that you get with an external device is that you get, it, it's very immediately visual. So I know that that fader's halfway up, that one's slightly less, and you can kind of get a quick, very quick overview of the state of all your tracks by looking at them. A rotary controller was um, kind of a solution to one of the problems with the faders. Unless your fader's motorized, when you start a session and you load from your software, it already knows where it was last time. But if, if you've zeroed all of these subsequently, they're not going to get put back to where the, the software thinks they are. So you've got this mismatch now between what your software thinks and what your hardware thinks. Um, one of the first solutions was to use rotary controllers. They just go round and round and round. They don't have a state. So, and then generally on a, on a um, more visual sort of proper device, you'd actually have a, a little... Um, circle of LEDs around it. And so the software can actually say that's where the thing is turned to rather than trying to manually do it with a motor. Um, with faders, you can't really do that. You, you could use motorized faders. In a, this one is not motorized, but it's very much similar to do. Um, just a quick jump in. I want to talk about skeuomorphism. It's a big buzzword now in the Mac world and everything that you shouldn't be basically trying to copy. So what I'm doing here is effectively I'm copying the old analog interface into my new digital world. Um, and whenever you do that, you've, you've got to kind of challenge yourself at, you know, are we being skeuomorphic? Are we just copying form over function? And are we, are we not really gaining anything? So my view here is that what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to get the function back rather than just the form. So, so we're not copying a mixer because it looks like a mixer. We're copying it because it's the fingers actually fit there correctly, and that's the intention. So I would say we're not really being skeuomorphic. Um, the temptation when we do it, sometimes some of these, the, the layout and stuff will tend to copy a mixer or an existing interfa hardware interface, analog interface more. A as we sort of go through the first iteration of design, people start realizing that certain things are actually not adding any functionality or laid out incorrectly in the new digital world. 
and, we, and the changes will um, come. And you'll see in some of the newer MIDI type devices that people are building, they've almost abandoned this kind of layout and are going into sort of more button matrixes and that sort of thing. So yeah, so I, th I don't think we are being skeuomorphic here and it's, we really are trying to capture the function. Um, USB MIDI, generally from a microcontroller version, writing a USB device is pretty complex. You need specialized chips, there's a lot of timing issues. Um, but at the USB 1 level spec, the system is slow enough that you can write it in software. So there's a company that have written a, an open source product called VUSB, which is a, a set of firmware libraries for um, Atmel chips. In this case, I'm using the ATtiny. And basically, everything becomes software driven. You've got three um, GPIO pins on your microcontroller. That's all you need to dedicate to it. And at a very low level, this thing is running at, I think you can run it at about six megahertz. So it's low power, low speed, and you can run a USB 1 type device off it and do everything in software. Um, and even the five volt, you just use a couple of diodes to get it down to three. So really basic. Um, and then everything's a software solution from there on. That's a device I did that uses that. Um, I was hoping to point you to the back and show you, but I don't think we're actually using them. It's one of the things we're doing with our video recording is we have a concept of a tally light. Um, and that's generally on each camera, you have a little red light on top of it. And as people switch cameras, the light will light up on that one. So the presenter knows where to face um, and which camera to look at. These are the ones we designed for, our, for the Perth Linux user group. Um, the traditional one we've been using with DB Switch is a serial based solution. And of course, there's no serial ports now on most devices, particularly on laptops. So it's a simple plug and play USB device. It looks like a MIDI device um, and it just takes note on, note off to turn the lights on. So middle C will turn the big red lights on and then it's DEF. Um, everything from a Linux point of view, as long as you've got ELSA loaded and you've got a MIDI, you can script anything on it. There's no additional software needed. So again, pretty simple circuit, tiny little board, I think about 20 bucks to make each one, really basic. And yeah, there's an example of it with one of our cameras. Um, the three at the back we're not really using at the moment because DB switch doesn't support signaling on them. It just tells us the main tally. But the intention was to extend that and use um, those for indicating other things like your camera's out of focus or we're about to switch over to you, make sure your camera's steady, that kind of thing. Uh, and there's another one I'm working at. I, not a lot I can show you there. It's basically it's the same thing again. It's an AT Tiny. It's a bunch of TTL devices just to switch, and that's going to do um, time code, MIDI display, and it's going to be extended with a bunch of buttons so you can stop. You can set markers in your track. So the idea is to have a rack mount with a nice big display, and you can use a sort of um, the MMC controls in MIDI, which is your your play, record, stop button type of functionality, and have 10 markers within your track so you can do um, sort of, you know, jumping between when you're doing the recording stuff. So bringing it again back out, giving you a little bit of a, a visual surface to work on. Uh, open software control, pretty much most of the stuff around this is involved in software designs. Obviously, once you, uh, if you want to move it to hardware, you just got to get a TCPIP stack up. But most of the work really happens in software, and it's dead easy software, really. There's a very simple Python controller. This is designed for DB switch. So um, it's not exactly all the code. There's a couple of sections left out, which are just GTK type setups. But really, the, four line, the five lines in green are all it is to get going, and you, you're running open sound control. Um, yeah, and that'll just allow on DB switch to you can switch to different cameras, ports that you're using. Because DB Switch supports open sound control as a, as a control protocol, as does Arda and a lot of other things. Um, this is another example of an OSC tool. Um, again, for DB Switch, I'll actually get up DB Switch and I can demonstrate that um, using both of them. The, this is a, an Android application that you can get. It allows you to find your own layouts. Um, with a little Java application that you can run on your PC. Uh, it does run on Linux. 
you just design a layout, you assign OSC controls to it, and pretty much you can use your phone to control anything. So in this case, it's a phone controlling DV switch. Um, yeah, and then just looking sort of towards the future, um, where are we kind of going with it? I think a lot more use of tablets are going to be coming out. Um, they kind of mix the versatility of the software, of the flexible being able to change the interface, but you're still kind of getting back to, to having a proper human level interface that's uh, you know, more appropriate to using rather than a mouse and keyboard. Phones have a lot of devices on them, accelerometers and stuff. I think a lot more use of those as gesture-based applications. This um, Touch OSC application actually allows you to assign some of the um, accelerator commands and stuff to it. So you can use your, your X acceleration and stuff to control things. So you can get pretty flexible with that. Slate Raven MTX is a new, relatively new um, mixing board that's just come out. It's a big 40 inch screen which is completely touch sensitive and they've moved all the controls onto that. Um, that seems to be getting pretty good reviews and it's, it's kind of another example. Things like the, um, the Monome project, which is basically it's just a matrix of buttons. People, people use it more for um, live sort of playing rather than a recording type thing. So th there's a lot of new ideas coming out and a lot of options um, that we'll be seeing in the future. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna try and get these in and just give you a quick show of how these work. So if my screen will let me get the command line up. So basically with this one, it's just a USB device. As I said, and I showed you it's a pretty simple circuit. And of course it's not going to see it this time, is it? Oh, sorry. Uh, just a trauma MIDI perspective. So the Tally LED, seeing the device. Uh, my desktop, I've got a little... And then that's, so that's basically just cycling through it. As you can see, so each light coming on and going off. Um, and literally, just to show you what it's doing, is really just saying, sending a MIDI commands with a, a MIDI note on command. So NO3E00 is send a note on with zero velocity, which means turn the light off and send the note on with um, 7F, which is full velocity, to turn it on. So pretty straightforward, really. Um, that one there. And then, again, as I was saying, with traditional um, MIDI devices, you would generally nowadays you would use something like this, which is just a, a MIDI to USB device. So it's, it's doing effectively what my... Um, earlier circuit was doing, but it gives you the proper um, dual DIN plugs coming out of it. So that's normal traditional MIDI. Uh, I'm just going to plug this in and see if I can get it working. This is really pushing my luck. That's pretty much working. Um, I'll get Ida up now and just show it to you.
so I've just got to quickly do that. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so you basically see there. But that's um, the typical issue you have with these, as you can see. So if this is set sort of, it's not really flowing very well, is it? I don't know what's going on here. Um, well, I must have got bashed. It's not it's sending it. But yeah, basically you can see you can enable your recording. So it's just like any normal one and it's um, pretty easily supported by Arda. And again, you can use um, open sound to control it as well. Um, yeah, I probably a little bit early, but so, so I think I'm about done. Yeah. Why is it called a tally light? That's a very good question. It's it an industry it's term. <laughs> are there any, you know, are there any um, uh, tablet interfaces which are tactile? Um, um, not that I'm aware of at the moment. I know they are um, playing quite a lot with that sort of haptic feedback on touch surfaces. By using specific vibrations at the right speeds, you can actually create all kinds of texture fields on the surface. So Actually, there's a lot of research going on there. Yeah, I was, um, I was reading about, I can't remember where it was now, but yeah, there is, I think there is a product, which um, it's either a product that's about to be released or has just been released, which it does, that does actually provide tactile feedback and it works on vibration model, as you said. Um, I can't remember the details of it now, but I'm fairly, yeah, it, there's either something about to be released or has been released that does exactly that. Um, I mean, that has implications for blind people and a whole bunch of other accessibility things just beyond music. But yeah, it's a very interesting area. But there's a slightly different way to do it as well. Um, yeah, you know, most of their tape machines do mixing consoles. And what they actually did was decent sized LCD screen and in front of it, transparent rows of controls. So you've got knobs and such in front of the screen. So it's not, and buttons as well, are all right. So it's not fully, it, it's an interesting way to mix it. It's a lot of fun. It's not fully virtualized, it's almost physical. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is that the function of the surface can change depending on what they put on the screen underneath it. And so it can, like you, you, you've got your fixed controls, but what they put underneath that dictates what those controls do and give you your visual Props, yeah. as it were. Yeah. I don't know. Slide across it would actually give you the sensation. No, I don't know if you ever saw any of the Microsoft Surface videos as well, but they have that nice capability of a, a camera that's watching the, you know, they've got a half silver screen and it can see what's placed on the table and differentiate oh, okay. stuff that's above the table versus stuff that's contacting the table. And so they have physical controls that are a plastic unit with a fiducial printed on the bottom. When you put it on the screen, it knows where that is, and as you turn it, it can see rotations. Yeah, and yeah. That, 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 the thing is, we can try to get those first interfaces to will, will work if you've got a whole system designed to work with it. Yeah. But uh, if you have to launch it, the chances of that actually mm -hmm. it happening being true once you get relatively into audio is very small because it inevitably has a huge pile of third party plugins written by someone or other. Yeah. And, you know, all the very few of which even support OSC, but it's um more complicated stuff like 
uh, specialist control service protocols or something, and then to add on top of that, right? and we want you also support this this particular haptic interface. Your chances are. Yeah, one of the problems even with OSC is trying to get from just to get through the door into your plugins. So you know, from your audio workstation, you can control every aspect of that. to actually pass that on to, to any plugins that you've loaded into there. Um, some of them, like Ida, do actually provide some of them, but it then tends to vary depending on some. One. And some, there are a few, a few commercial plugins that are Yeah, not there yet. One of the things that, um, I mean, yes, you touched on the idea that tablets are um, sort of increasingly being used as control services, and there's a lot of um, professional mixing desks um, from the likes of Midas and, and, and Co. Um, and even lighting consoles um, where they don't use OSC and they provide a single application for a particular make of tablet. And if you happen to not run that tablet, then you're out of luck. Um, what is starting to happen a little bit now is that some hardware manufacturers are using OSC internally, which at least gives the community an opportunity to write a skin for other devices. Um, and also, of course, gives you the option of scripting stuff and all that sort of thing as well that you just don't have with the pure graphical control. And so the, um, the relevance of OSC well, for for um for hardware devices, may actually rise over the next couple of years as more and more um, manufacturers realise that yeah, actually, if we go with OSC, then it's actually more flexible, and we're not locking ourselves in the single tablet um, variants and this sort of thing. So there's there's going to be a bit of a growth area in that. OSC really seems to be one of those things where you have the right. Standard technology solution for ages and convincing people to actually take it up as it seems to just be this giant struggle that's been you know close to a decade. I think OSC will take over any time now. Oh, it's yeah, I think it's um, in many respects it's the same. It's probably the same open source problem that we've had all along, but in a slightly different guise. Yeah. Um, you know, for a long, long time, and to a certain extent, it still exists. The whole video card driver problem. Um, which has you know, slowly become better over the last couple of years. Um, and before that was the network card problem that slowly got better as, as the manufacturers were going up. And in many respects, I think we're starting to see the same sort of thing happening with the more advanced hardware um, devices that are now coming out, that we've started out that people are writing proprietary protocols to control their own proprietary devices. Um, and of course that means that if you don't happen to run the one tablet that they are interested in supporting, you're basically out in the cold. Um, whereas, you know, slowly a few manufacturers are now saying to wake up and say, hey, if we use OSC, then it doesn't really impact our ability to write our own control application, but it means that others can also do it and they might be able to do cool things with it that we never thought of. So, Again, it's probably the perennial case of having to add uh, to uh, educate manufacturers of the fact that yeah, it is actually worth your while putting OSC in these devices, especially the internet network ones. Because as you said, whilst yeah, putting OSC on a small MCU is problematic. Um, you know, these devices, at least the ones I'm talking about, do not have a simple MCU on them anymore. Oh yeah, um, they've got plenty of firepower and. Putting OSC in them really is incredibly trivial. Um, you know, most of these are Ethernet connected already, so they've already got the stack in them, um, and it becomes basically a no-brainer. Um, so that's, I think, what we've got to sort of hope for going forward, and maybe even start campaigning about, because it's starting. It is actually starting to get ridiculous that um, you can have a perfectly functional tablet, but not be able to control an iLight, because the iLight application doesn't run Android. Good. Well, thanks very much. I've got a question. Oh, yeah. Um, what about MIDI sync, um, like for devices, like drum machines? Uh, syncing with a time code? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's, yeah, the time code is pretty simple as long as any one device is providing that. Can I rephrase that question? Yeah. Are there any kind of like open source software um, for the MIDI synchronous like no. um, as a plugin like to use the CT like synchronous Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Synchronizing the like, time code sync. But but also like over a network like on the internet. Oh, okay. I'm not aware that. I think the internet's all too laggy, really. There is some... Because there's a proprietary... I've seen some software, software being that does that. ...network-based sort of collaboration, but it's... I think it's still pretty difficult. I, I don't know much about it, but NetJack may or may not have MIDI in it. I don't know. Um, I know that NetJack allows you to synchronise audio streams across networks. Um, what I can't recall is whether they are also capable of doing MIDI transport. But yeah, I know that Jack deals with the audio side. Yeah. I think Jack does its own synchronising code that doesn't use MIDI time code. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't use MIDI time code, although I think it can transport. Yeah. But it doesn't actually. Yeah, Jack has its own time management and clocking system. And it may be that NetJack can do MIDI, I'm not sure. I, mean, I haven't used NetJack extensively myself, so I don't know. But I know that they've got the audio side dealt with. And if they've got the audio, it would be, in many respects, surprising if they want to do MIDI. But that would be one avenue to look at. From MIDI over Ethernet, is, I mean, there is there's definitely a Net MIDI protocol, and that works in Linux, I played with that. Net MIDI? Yeah. Many associations themselves are looking at HD MIDI, which is sort of an extra evolution. Um, yeah, 16 bit controls, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and yeah. Network and Bluetooth and everything would be included in that. I guess the other thing, um, I mean, again, it's probably important to note too that um, with MIDI synchronisation, is the fact that the problem of doing it locally is totally different to the remote as well. If you're doing it locally, the delays are irrelevant. But if you are doing it across multiple sites, then suddenly there becomes an issue where you've got to have network lag and transport delays and the stuff's to get a little mess, which is the sort of thing that makes NetJack complex. But I think that's sort of solved most of those problems for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Great. Thank you.